Good day and welcome to Letters and Politics. I'm Mitch Jezerich. Today we are going to be in conversation once again about the Constitution, the history of the Constitution, and not just the creation of the Constitution, but the several decades leading to the creation of the Constitutions and the several decades that would follow. My guest for this conversation is Akhil Reed Amar. He is a Sterling Professor of Law and Political Science at Yale University, and he's the author of a number of books. His latest is called The Words That Made Us, America's Constitutional Conversation, 1760 to 1840. Akhil Reed Amar, great to see you again. Thank you for taking this time to join me today. And I'm so glad you said again, because I've really enjoyed our previous conversations, as you know, um, and I hope now your audience is about to know, I'm from Walnut Creek, um, so I'm a Bay Area kid, and, um, and I love doing the show with you. And we, we love having you on. And I want to begin with a person that, that, that's important in your book, a historical figure, and his name is James Otis Jr. Tell me who he was and why he's important in understanding how we would end up getting a constitution. So this book, which is, it's a long book, but it's written for ordinary people and it tells a lot of stories. It does law stuff, but there's a lot of history and history does involve, I think at its best storytelling, it involves analysis of data and, and, and all sorts of other things. But I want to tell a story about all sorts of people, some of whom you've heard of, George Washington, the big six uh, in the founding era typically are the, the first four presidents, George Washington, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, plus Alexander Hamilton and Ben Franklin. And one of the dedicatees of the book is my hero, Lynn Miranda. Um, so, so I'm going to tell you about people you've heard of before, like those big six. But I also want to introduce you, the audience, to some fascinating characters that you may not have heard of, unless you're just a total um, history junkie, political junkie. And one of them is James Otis, who is this um, crusading lawyer in Boston. So um, I think about this as if it were a movie, act one, scene one. And, 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 and here's, a, and this is, um, and so when do you begin the story? Most people begin the story of the American, because it's about the Constitution, but you can't understand the Constitution without the American Revolution. So, I, Constitution is 1787. That's too late to start the story. So, I have to at least have the American Revolution. That's 1776. But where does the lead up to the American Revolution really begin? So, here's what I decide, and it's almost as if I'm like a, a movie director or something. Act one, scene one. Here's um, uh, my story. I say that the story begins when People in America are happy British subjects, um, and they're proud to be um, subjects of the king, and then stuff begins to happen. The standard story um, is that discontent begins to emerge in 1763 when Parliament starts to pass statutes, the Sugar Act and then the Stamp Act, taxing Americans, and Americans start to uh, resist that. And there's a 13-year period. Um, almost every uh, book about the American Revolution, and the subtitle is 1763 to 1776. So that's how everyone has told the story before. I'm saying, actually, the story begins a little earlier than that. It begins in 1760, 61, and James Otis is there from the very beginning. Um, and in fact, here are three people who were there at the very beginning. Actually, let me tell you four. First, his first real appearance on the screen is the new king of England. His name is George III. He's 22 years old, and he becomes king in late 1760s. His grandfather dies. And word reaches Boston, uh, basically Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, or the sh a day or two after that, um, that week, 1760. The end of 1760, news arrives in Boston. Oh, the old king is dead. We've got a new king. And they're toasting him. They're really, you know, they're, they're proud to be Britons and we have a new king. Hooray. So um, here's what happens, though. Um, when one king dies and a new king emerges, um, uh, all the um, uh, sort of... Uh, how uh, the, the um, legal authorities, they're called writs, W-R-I-T-S, um, need to be reissued within six months in the name of the new king. So it turns out 
that when one king dies, there are going to have to be some things that happen so that the British government can keep doing what it was doing before. But now in the name of King George III, rather than King George II, enter James Otis, who goes to court and says, actually, the Brits are doing things that they shouldn't be doing. And this young guy who wants to make a political name for himself goes to court and starts crusading against certain things that the Brits are doing. And this is before the Stamp Act, the Sugar Act. This is in 1761. So I got this crusading lawyer who wants to actually make a political name for himself. He's, he's self-made. His father's a famous politician. His father's Speaker of the House of the Massachusetts Assembly, but his father didn't go to Harvard. His father um, was self-made. He's the first generation to go to Harvard. He's law trained. He's very proud of himself. He speaks Latin and he wants to, as I said, you know, uh, ingratiate himself with the people of Boston. So he comes to court and he says, actually, what the Brits are doing isn't right. It's a thing called writs of assistance. These pieces of paper are authorizing very intrusive searches and seizures into the homes of Bostonians. So he goes to court and um, and is trying to basically um, uh, persuade the judges, but the judges are basically picked by the establishment there. Um, but, but he's also trying to basically um, appeal to the crowd, to uh, 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 the people. Um, and, and, and Boston then is not totally different than Berkeley now. There, there are a lot of interesting folks out there, and he's going to be, he's an agitator. So I got him in the room, and he's interesting because in five years, there's going to be a thing called the Stamp Act Congress. It's going to be the first time America, not just in Boston, but people up and down the continent start to mobilize against Parliament. And the guy who actually organizes the whole thing is named James Otis. But this is his first appearance on a public stage. No one's heard of him before. But I got two other people in the room. And so there's this lawyer who's very ambitious, and he's an agitator also. Um, he's going to, a version of him later on is going to be Sam, Samuel Adams, the agitator. But Otis is there even before Samuel Adams. I got another guy in the room. He's a young lawyer. No one's ever heard of him before, but he's taking notes. Um, and 50 years later, he's going to say, actually, that's when the American Revolution began. Not with a stamp back, not 1773, 1763, excuse me, but 1760, 61. And I was there taking notes. And it's important that he wants history to know that he was there at the very beginning his name is John Adams. He's one of the big six. He's going to be, you know, president of the United States before that vice president. He's going to be, co you know, drafter of the Declaration of Independence. He's a big guy. No one's ever heard of him before. He's just a, 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 a newbie lawyer sitting in the courtroom taking notes. So I got him in the same room as James Otis, and they're later going to be political allies of fomenting revolution. And I got a third guy in the room that your audience, most of them, has never heard of. And I want to introduce him to you. His name is Thomas Hutchinson. He's the judge. He's very loyal to the king. He's very loyal to the, the government. He's an establishment guy. He's not, he's not an evil person, but he's a hierarchical person, sort of authoritarian, sort of very traditionalist. Um, and he's in the end going to rule against Hutchinson. If he were, and he's going to become the most prominent American-born loyalist um, in the continent. So when um, uh, things start to get unpleasant, most of the Americans are going to side with James Otis and John Adams, and, and they're going to actually revolt against the king, who they were very loyal to when they first heard the news that they have a new king. They, they raised their, their um, glasses in alehouses and toasted their new king, long live the king. They're very loyal um, in 1760, but 16 years later, they're going to declare their independence and it and and and, and even earlier than that 15 years later there's going to be uh, lexington and concord um and before that there's a boston massacre and 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 there's going to be um uh, uh the battle of bunkers hill so so but in 1760 they're all loyal britons but james otis is starting to agitate and john adams is in the room and the guy he's going to agitate against thomas hutchinson who by the late 1770s will be the the most important supporter of the crown, um, Thomas Hutchinson is his name, um, is the chief judge. And here's, if Thomas Hutchinson, and, and, and he's not a bad guy, even though he's on the wrong side of the American Revolution. And I want uh, the audience to see, look, they were, they were decent people and they sometimes disagreed about things. We don't have to demonize everyone who, who's on the other side. If 
Thomas Hutchinson were alive, and, and our audience has never heard of them. You've heard of all the American revolutionaries, but what about the folks on this side, the folks who lost? Hutchinson is the best and the brightest, and he's a decent person. He's religious, but he's also not bigoted. He's, he's humble. He's hardworking. He's industrious. He's smart. He loves his hometown, Boston, but he also loves his king, and eventually he's going to have to choose between them. If he were alive today, Mitch, I think he would basically be Mitt Romney. You know, smart guy, good businessman, not an evil person at all, but like a company man, a, a hierarchical guy, a traditionalist, but but not evil incarnate at all. And and so act one, scene one for me, because I'm telling the stories. I got three people for the first time in a room together with other people watching the crusading lawyer, James Otis, the young legal scribe, just a young lawyer writing everything down. John Adams, and the traditionalist um, uh, king's man, Thomas Hutchinson. And those three guys are going to be three of the 10 most significant figures um, over the next um, 15 years. And other people will start to come in, Ben Franklin, George Washington, Sam Adams, Patrick Henry, Thomas Jefferson, etc. But, oh, Act 1, Scene 1, even before the Stamp Act and the Sugar Act, these three guys are in a room and sparks fly. Tell me more about these writ of assistance. And my understanding is these were meant to try to combat smuggling that was occurring. So how prevalent was smuggling as well? Big time, um, because um, the, no one likes paying taxes, um, and especially and the Bostonians. They're they're fundamentally loyal. They're they're um, uh, um, and and law abiding in all sorts of ways. They're um, rather religious folk and, and rule followers in all sorts of ways, but they don't like paying taxes. Um, and they think they're contributing to the British Empire in all sorts of ways. They'll they'll fight the French. Um, there's a, a war going on. It's, it's actually the First World War. We, we call it the French and Indian War. The rest of the world calls it the Seven Years War. So um, John Hancock, he hasn't yet um, entered my story, but our audience knows who he is. He's going to sign his name um, uh, uh, very big in the Declaration of Independence. He's a very prominent Boston businessman, but frankly, he's a smuggler. Um, he's bringing in all sorts of stuff um, and not trying to and avoid trying to pay the taxes. The 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 people of Boston don't uh, uh, basically. Um, uh, the, the juries in Boston are going to be on Otis's side. The crowd is basically going to be on Otis's side. They don't like paying these taxes. Now, how do the writs of assistance figure into that? Under the writs of assistance, the customs officers, if they suspect that um, someone has, has got smuggled goods in their warehouse, in a barn, or even in their residence, um, if you have this piece of paper called a writ of assistance and you're a customs officer, you can actually demand that the, house, that the barn, the warehouse, even the private residence be opened. Um, and um, so this is giving you, in effect, open sesame, carte blanche to search for smuggled goods. And Otis says, you know, th th this, this deprives us of our historic rights as English people, you know, like a man's house is his castle. Your your the, the government, par, the parliament is um is if if this is a valid thing, then the British government is authorizing the most intrusive searches of people's houses imaginable. Now, Otis actually slightly misstates it because there's one thing I didn't tell you, and that Otis actually doesn't talk about so much. Here's the way in which, uh, um, although this is not great from from a privacy point of view. Hutchinson um, and British judges who uphold writs of assistance, even in Britain, understand it has one safeguard. Here's the safeguard. And, and Otis says, these are illegal even in Britain. And Hutchinson says, well, let's check. And he actually uh, sends a letter back to England saying, are these legal in Britain? And takes a few months um, for the letters to cross the Atlantic back and forth. But eventually he learns that these writs are legal in Britain. Well, why? Because Britain loves liberty and privacy and, and, and home ownership. And here's what Otis actually doesn't talk about, or John Adams too, because they're rabble rousers. You know, they're, um, they're like William Kunstler or something like that, you know, a crusading um, left-wing lawyer um, uh, for um, the people against the establishment. What Otis didn't quite um, re realize is 
Yeah, the writ authorizes a customs official to break into even, not, not, actually, to use even force to break into someone's house to intrude on, upon them. But, it, and if you find smuggled goods, oh, you know, that, that homeowner is toast um, in, in, the, in the house, in the warehouse, in the barn. But if he doesn't find anything, oh, you can sue his butt off. Um, and a local jury will sock uh, it to him for damages. So he's going to he's not going to want to search just on a, on a lark um, because um, if, if he searches and he's wrong, um, a, a jury can um, uh, uh, hold him liable for serious damages. He, he didn't have what today we would call qualified immunity, qualified That's immunity. Exactly. That's exactly what he didn't have. And actually, um, the very first law review article I ever wrote as a law professor it's called the Sovereignty and Federalism, criticizes qualified immunity and governmental immunity. Um, and actually says, you know, we've been taught, Mitch, warrants are good things. You know, cops always need warrants. Yeah, up to a point. But here's the problem. If a cop has a warrant and, and breaks into your house, you can't sue the cop because there's a kind of a judicial um, um, uh, uh, authorization. Um, now, um, and and these uh, uh uh, writs of assistance were kind of like warrants. They were immunity for the police officer, and, and they were overbrought. In a Mars world, um, if a police officer does something that's unreasonable, you should be allowed to sue, um, and a jury of your peers should decide whether what the police officer did was reasonable or unreasonable. If it was reasonable, fine, but the cop, then the cop shouldn't be held liable. But if it was unreasonable or unconstitutional, or if the cop is violating your constitutional rights in other ways, then they should pay. That should be it. But but you're right. Today, courts ask two questions. One, was, were the police officers acting constitutionally? But second, even if they weren't, should we insulate them anyway from, and, and, and I don't, and that's called qualified immunity, and I don't believe in it. And the founders didn't believe in it, in fact. They didn't and believe in it. They, they, they did they not. actually were explicit about it, because this is a big debate yes. that's happening on Capitol Hill right now. Yes, over it is. Reform. And and I actually wrote about this in 1987 in the Yale Law Journal, and I wrote about it again in 1994 in the Harvard Law Review. And now the country is finally actually um, um, waking up. At this. And conservatives, Mitch, are talking about this. One of my students, he's actually conservative. He's probably the leading young constitutional scholar on the conservative side of the spectrum. He's at the University of Chicago. His name is Will Bode. He spent several years in the Bay Area. He actually was a, a sort of a junior scholar at Stanford, B-A-U-D-E. Um, and um, he's been crusading against this. And you know who the justice is thus far? Who's been talking about this the most? It's, it's Justice Clarence Thomas saying, Hmm. Maybe we should take another look at this. So, so certain libertarians on the right are beginning to focus on this. Certain conservatives, from an originalist point of view, are beginning to talk about this. Both scholars and judges. So, stay tuned on this issue. That was another reason, truthfully, why I wanted to start the story where I did, because it has implications for the American Revolution more generally. It's a great storytelling device because. I got three people in a room who are all going to be really important characters um, in the uh, over the next 15 years. But it also is an interesting little case study in what we would call the Fourth Amendment. It, it's it a seems case study in holding government accountable. It, it seems like what's keeping Congress from striking a deal on policing reform is the demand for to undo or to reform qualified immunity. If it didn't come from Congress, if you're saying that there are judges that are, you know, sort of looking at this, including Clarence Thomas, is this something that could be also dealt with through the courts? Yes. In, in my view, courts were the ones who actually, frankly, invented qualified immunity. They created it. And I think even in the absence of the statute, they would be authorized to say, you know what, on reflection, this was a mistake that we made. Um, it's not constitutionally sound. And just in the same way that Brown versus Board of Education said, yeah, Plessy is a precedent, but, but we made a mistake. Um, um, separate really isn't equal. Um, so um, we are going to move away from Plessy. Yes, in my view, courts, even on their own, could and should do this. I've been urging them to do it, as I said, since 1987.
This is Letters on Politics, and we are in conversation with Akhil Reed Amar, who is a leading scholar in this country on the Constitution. He is the Sterling Professor of Law and Political Science at Yale University. He's the author of a number of books. His latest is called The Words That Made Us, America's Constitutional Conversation, 1760 to 1840. I do want to go back for one last question about James Otis Jr., because I think as I was spending time with your book this past weekend, what really stood out to me was when he was making these arguments in the courts, and he'd lose in the courts, but when he was making these arguments against the writ of assistance, he would come up with this argument that you cannot make a law that goes against the Constitution, which was really interesting to me because, A, there was no American Constitution at the time, and in Great Britain, they don't have a written Constitution themselves but he seemed to so on one hand and and i think you make this point in the book you know he sort of loses that argument there but he also creates this idea of a constitution that you cannot violate in law making you're absolutely right you know it's at the time he's making it is kind of legally unsound in a way oh but oh boy that idea is going to become really important in the American Revolution and the American um, legal tradition. And the guy who, the lawyer, um, the legal scribe who's writing it down actually puts it in all capital letters because it's it's just so arresting. And, and here's actually how John Adams, the young lawyer, the legal scribe, writes it down. Um, even, um, so, so what he says is, um, um, uh, uh, all precedents are under the control of the principles of law. Um, and then he says, um, even if it were, even if Parliament said it, it would be void. An act against the Constitution is void. And, and Adams puts that in all caps. Like, and Adams is saying, wow, what an amazing uh, I thought. And it's actually not quite legally sound when he says it for the reasons you identify. In Britain, their tradition is parliamentary sovereignty whatever parliament says that's the last word and um but otis is actually saying no there's a higher law even than parliament and and when he says it it's not quite legally right but it's going to have legs and it's going to become the american doctrine of constitutional supremacy even over the legislature and you put your finger on why in america we have deviated from britain because in america We have a written constitution that was adopted by the people themselves. And the people themselves, when they ratify the constitution, are higher even than than Congress. So, yes, this deep idea in America that actually Congress isn't really the supreme law of the land, the constitution is, um, and that an act of Congress that's in violation of the Constitution is void and that courts can and should say so. That's going to become the American doctrine of judicial review. And in between that current American legal orthodoxy and the British legal orthodoxy of parliamentary sovereignty in 1760, there was one other idea that I talk about in the second chapter. And that's this idea, even if you think in Britain, parliamentary laws should be the be all and end all, um, um, in America, it's not right because actually we're not represented in Parliament. No taxation without representation. The guy who coins that phrase, I mean, James Otis, he hasn't coined it in 1760, but he coins it in famous speeches in 1763, 64. That's why, just from a storytelling point of view, I just loved it when I ran across this story where for the first time he and America's leading loyalist, Hutchinson, and the future second president of the United States, John Adams, is also going to be Rob Browser, are in a room for the first time. And as I said before, sparks start to fly. And some of them are intellectual sparks. What you just said, Otis is thinking creatively. He's a little bit out of control in, in his oral argument, but he starts to refine it. Okay, maybe in Britain, Parliament is the supreme law of everything, but we are not represented in Parliament, so that's not fair when they're taxing us. And that's uh, that's 1763-64, no taxation without representation. By 1776, 
Thomas Jefferson can say, not just taxation, Parliament has no authority over us to do anything at all, not just tax laws, but any other laws. They shouldn't be allowed to restrict jury trials in America. They shouldn't be allowed to suspend our colonial charters. They shouldn't be allowed to introduce troops in America. So no legislation, uh, no imposition without representation. That's going to be James Otis in, in, or the, the, the Patriot position in 1776. And then eventually we're going to say, ah, we Americans are going to adopt a written constitution that's going to limit government in all sorts of ways, even Congress, even um, a police. And we're going to have a Fourth Amendment to the Constitution that's going to specify certain rules about houses and, and limit searches and seizures. And we're going to have other rules limiting um, the government when they're trying to restrict freedom of speech. And, and so we're going to have a constitution that's high, a written one that we, the people, adopt that's higher than our parliament, which we call Congress. Is this the beginning of, and I guess, an idea of constitutional authority, or, or have we yeah. ever seen it yeah. in history before this, where well, you have a document, you know, a founding document that you can't, I mean, you can maybe <laughs> amend it like we can, but as is, you can't create new laws that would go against that document. Well, when you say, is this the beginning, there's always something the day before and the day before that. So I, ha but I have to start my story somewhere. And if I have to start my story, I think this is for two reasons now, Mitch. You've given me, you've given the audience a second reason, as good a place to start as any, and I'll give you a third. So the first is, these are the characters who are going to be the leading characters for the next 15 years. James Otis is going to be a rabble rouser, and he's going to organize resistance to the Stamp Act. And again, in America in 1765, people from all sorts of colonies up and down a continent for the first time are going to get together um, to resist. That hadn't happened before, that people are getting together to resist Parliament, and the guy who organizes that is James Otis. And this is his first time on a public stage, 1760. So, And, and the leading loyalist, as I said, um, sides with the king, is Thomas Hutchinson, um, and Adams is going to be important. So, one, I got them all together in the room for the first time. Two... He's making an intellectual argument about constitutional supremacy that really wasn't made so clearly before, was actually a little bit wild and out of control when he makes it, but is going to be refined in future periods. One, on Democrat, on, on, and on democratic grounds. Parliament shouldn't really be telling us what to do because we're not represented. Um, and eventually, a constitution should be superior, a written one, to a statute, because ordinary people are going to especially ratify an American written constitution. And yes, Otis is as good a place to start on constitutional supremacy and judicial review as anywhere. And, th and so there is an intellectual idea that you see there first, before 1763. And finally, John Adams, writing many, many years after the fact, very famously says, then and there were the seeds of the American Revolution. So Adams, at least, thinks that's where it began. Now, what I say is, of course, Adams would want to think that because he's in the room and Adams is a total narcissist. And it's very important for Adams that he be there first. But he's not totally making it up because what, I, what I'm saying is before Patrick Henry has done anything at all. Thomas Jefferson is in knickers at the time. So, so the people of Virginia are not in this story at all. Patrick Henry's, the George Washingtons, um, he's been involved, George Washington has in a military way in the 1750s, but George Washington is not doing anything political in 1761. And, uh, uh, and Thomas Jefferson isn't paying attention to the writs of assistance and neither is Patrick Henry. Oh, but James Otis, the rabble rouser is, and John Adams is in the room taking notes and in retrospect, he says, actually, th that's where the agitation began, but also that's where this big idea of constitutional supremacy, maybe that's at least as good a place as any where it began, which is why in John Adams' notes, contemporaneous at the time, in screaming capital letters, it's like, all acts against the Constitution are void. Let's stay on figures from Virginia here. You make an argument in this book that, we give too much credit to James Madison, oftentimes seen as the father, really, of the Constitution, the creator of the Constitution, the Virginia plan, these things. You say we give John Mad uh, James Madison too much credit for the creation of the Constitution. Right. And, and I say instead of James Madison, we should give credit to two other sources. 
First, if we have to pick a person, it's obviously George Washington. It's Washington's constitution. That's Here, interesting because George Washington frequently is portrayed as almost being reluctant to even go to the Constitutional Convention. He's the presiding officer of the convention. Um, but he, I, I guess I, I had always saw him, and I'm not a constitutional scholar, but I had always seen him as just someone who's making sure, you know, the, the meeting was properly gaveled in, and, you know. And, and I was taught the same, Mitch, you may not be a constitutional scholar, but you're very well read. Lots of people have never heard of the Virginia plan and, and all the details. You are giving the sto story that most of us were taught, that I was taught. And in the course of researching this book, I came to change my mind about all that. I bet you could find something I wrote 30 years ago somewhere or some lecture that I gave where I said, Madison's the father of the Constitution. That's what we were all taught. But I don't think so. So, again, if I pick a person, I'll give you the reasons why in your audience, why it's George Washington. So I'm going to make the argument for George Washington. But more generally, I'm going to say it's not James Madison. It's all of America. It's bottom up. It's crowdsourced. It's, it's, it's much broader. I tell the story of the top down great man, but I'm also telling it's a bottom up story about an amazing culture, um, which is all about, frankly, newspapers, you know, precursors of you, uh, the, the media that creates actually a conversation in which lots of people are involved. Okay. But let me first say, if I have to pick one person, it's obviously George Washington. And here's why because he has the only art, he defeats the British, he has the only army on the continent, and he gives it all up to go to his farm. And he doesn't try to make himself king the way um, uh, William the Conqueror made himself king, the way Cromwell made himself Lord Protector, the way Augustus Caesar made himself emperor, and Napoleon would make himself emperor. Um, Washington has the only ar uh, functional army and he walks away He's the greatest man in the world. He thrills the world. And so he's trusted to not be just grasping for power. And then he, and he promises just to, to, to just go to his farm. So, yes, w Madison does play a role. Here's the role he plays. Begging Washington, and he's not the only one. Alexander Hamilton does. Um, uh, others do. Uh, Henry Knox, uh, Jay, please go to Philadelphia. Okay. Um, your country needs you. Um, the system isn't working and you have unique credibility. So Washington comes out of retirement and Madison's big contribution is encouraging Washington to come out of retirement. Okay. Now there's this conclave because the Confederation isn't working. Um, no one's, they, they, there's no money in the till. There's no way to pay actually the, the soldiers that, 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 that fought and, and, and we're not, you know, paying them what we owe them and we're not paying creditors. And if we can't pay the creditors for the past war, Who's going to lend us money if there's another war? So Washington comes out of retirement, and here's America. No one's ever heard of James Madison. Everyone in America has heard of George Washington. He's the most famous American in the world, with the possible exception of Ben Franklin, who's very ancient by this point, and Washington is in his prime still. He is the unanimously selected presiding officer. The thing about the Constitution that's new is not that there's a bicameral legislature, most of the states have that. That's the American model. It's not that there's three branches of government, legislative, executive, and judicial. That's, again, America, the basic template of America. Now, James Madison is in favor of that, but, but so is Henry Knox, so is John Jay. That's not a unique Madisonian idea. It's basically the American template. So, so what's new about the Constitution? Not legislative bicameralism, not three branches, legislature, executive, judiciary. Here's what's new. It has a massively powerful chief executive officer. Our president is so much more powerful than any governor in America. A four-year term, infinitely reelectable, independently elected from the legislature, his own veto pen. Only in Massachusetts does a governor have his own veto pen. A really powerful pardon pen. Gavin Newsom is going to need to decide. I, I know you're, you know, this is a California audience about Sirhan. Sirhan, you know, so uh, control of um, a continental army and navy, um, massive powers to appoint and actually fire um, all sorts of federal officials. It's a massively powerful president compared to any state governor. It is created, for, in effect, by and for Washington, because everyone knows that if the Constitution's ratified, Washington's going to be the first president. So he's he's unanimous. Everyone is that, in America. Does that mean he's 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 
uh, does that mean he's specifically providing the language or so, at least the ideas so he, on that presence? yeah so so i'm saying everyone sees the philadelphia convention as credible because washington goes to it on day one he's unanimously selected unanimously by all the delegates the presiding officer we call the new guy president because that's what they called washington at philadelphia mr president mr presiding presiding officer now does he say these things no he's so influential he doesn't have to he just smiles or frowns and they give him what he wants there are 55 people who are there all told um, they're not all there at the same time but all told 55 people 39 are going to sign their names to him five of them are actually his uh, half of them um, fought in the revolutionary war more than half a third of them fought in Washington's army, and five of them from five different states, and only 12 that show up. Rhode Island doesn't show up. Five different men from five different states were his aides de camp in the war itself. Alexander Hamilton from New York, um, Mifflin from Pennsylvania, McHenry from Maryland, uh, Pinckney from uh, South Carolina, um, and Randolph from Virginia. Now imagine that. There are only 55 in all. 39 are going to sign from five of them from five different states are your, your law clerks, as it were, your, your little assistants. So he, and this is why people miss it, because he, who, who was the scribe, the little John Adams-like person writing down all the notes? That's James Madison. So in the same way that John Adams is writing about an event where he was there and saying, oh, that was important, James Madison is later going to write notes at the Philadelphia Convention, and he's going to record all the speeches he gave and his pals gave. Um, and so if you look at that, you think, oh, James Madison is driving events. When you step back, no, not at all. George Washington is getting everything he wants. Almost all of Madison's unique ideas fail. Madison wants um, a proportionate Senate, he loses, um, uh, 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 proportion to the population. He wants the Congress to be able to veto every state law before it's even adopted, he loses on that. Um, he um, wants the veto pen of the president to be shared with judges, he loses on that. He actually writes to Washington before the convention, I had never really thought a lot about executive power. Um, um, and he's writing to Washington. Washington is not writing to him. Everyone knows that Washington is the man, and that's before Philadelphia. Then at the convention, he gets everything he wants, which, and the big thing is a powerful president. At the end of the convention, he writes a letter on behalf of all the delegates saying, here's why we're doing what we're doing. That letter, it's a letter to Congress, is reprinted alongside the Constitution in every, virtually every printed copy of the Constitution, tens of thousands of copies are reprinted. And here's what people are saying. The proposed Constitution is about five pages long and Washington's letter, okay? And then during the ratification process, George Washington's name alone, the fact that he's in favor of it, um, has more weight than every other person put together times, than, than the, the Federalist Papers, which are part, part, some of which are written by Madison, also with Hamilton and Jay. Um, so George Washington's reputation carries the thing across um, you know, to, to victory. And then Washington is unanimously elected president twice. Every single elector votes from, whereas Madison doesn't get a, a Senate position that he wants, barely gets elected to the House of Representatives. It's Washington's Constitution start to finish, which you won't see if you just read the notes of the Philadelphia Convention because they're Madison's notes. And Washington is the strong, silent type. He doesn't say anything, but everyone knows what he wants and gives it to him. Akhil Reed Amar, our time is short. And there is one other story I wanted to dive in with you before we let you go that you tell in your book, The Words That Made Us, America's Constitutional Conversation, 1760 to 1840. And that is the election of 1800. So now we already have the Constitution. Kind of impossible to do one of these interviews about all this period of time in 50 minutes. Yes. Uh, but, but the reason I want to talk specifically about the 1800 election, and this is between James, uh, or this is between Thomas Jefferson and John Adams. Um, the reason I want to talk about this election is because it was a critical moment in history that I found myself thinking a lot about and looking at parallels, I, I, I don't believe history repeats itself necessarily, but some of the parallels that we were observing in this last presidential election that we 
had. Tell me the importance of knowing the presidential election of 1800. I'm so glad you asked this because I wrote the book before the election of 2020. But after the election of 2020, I said, oh my God, there are all sorts of eerie echoes and, and parallels. Um, and um, so um, uh, I don't know if, if your audience it would be interested, but I actually wrote up a piece. It's on the internet and a website uh, for History News Network in which I, I retell, I take an excerpt from the book and retell the story um, basically now that we are thinking about January 6th and, and, and what happened. Okay, so let me take a step back. I told you that people who were skeptical of the Constitution gave it a chance because they trusted George Washington. Because George Washington didn't want to make himself king. Um, he had the chance and, 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 gave, and gave up his army. Uh, George III, when asked, um, when said, someone goes up to him and says, they say Washington's going to disband his army, and George III is reputed to say, say, have said, if he does that, he'll be the greatest man in the world. So people trusted Washington. And by the way, Washington, in a first draft of his inaugural address, says, here's why you can trust me. He, he pulls it out. I don't have a son. I don't have anyone to give it to. I'm not going to try to create a throne um, because um, I'm father of all of you, all the country. I'm not father of any kid. In fact, so there's no Donald Jr. or Bobby Kennedy, since we're talking, you know, these days about Sir Hans. Sir Hans. There's no one else I'm going to try to pass it on to, you know, or Andrew Cuomo, if we're talking about this, this, America today. Think about dynasties, you know, and, 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 I, and I'm a Californian. I was nine years old when Bobby Kennedy was shot in, in this state, you know, and Bobby Kennedy's um, a, a daughter, she was married to um, Andrew Cuomo. You know, Andrew Cuomo isn't just the daughter of, of uh, I mean, the son of, of Mario Cuomo. He's, you know, married to a, a, a Robert Kennedy daughter. And Arnold Schwarzenegger is, is, you know, was married to Maria Shriver, who's, you know, Bobby Kennedy's um, and John Kennedy's and Ted Kennedy's niece. So, oh, we're still living with this stuff. I, I so, mean, never mind the Bush family. All, all of this yeah. stuff, you know, um, everywhere. Um, um, uh, 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 so, Washington says, you can trust me. He pulls it out because it's a little too personal. But people trust Washington because he doesn't want to make himself king. And he steps down. He would have been re-reelected, probably unanimously. But he, he wants to create a precedent, really, that the republic is greater than any one man. And he, and he doesn't explain this. He's, he's the strong, silent type. He says very little at Philadelphia. He says very little in his resignation. But, but, but I think that's what he's trying to do now. For the first time, America is actually going to have a contested election because Washington was head and shoulders, literally, and in other words, above everyone else. So, so again, he won unanimously twice. Every elector voted for George Washington twice. Now we have a real contest and, and when Washington leaves and it's Adams against Jefferson, two people who joins together, a northerner and a southerner, to generate the Declaration of Independence. And I told you... Adams, the reason Adams is saying, oh, it started in 1761 with James Otis is because he wants to say it started in Massachusetts. It started with me in the room. No one had heard of Thomas Jefferson. You know, forget the Virginians. So, so, but he's saying that sort of later, but he's looking back and saying, I was there at the beginning, not Jefferson. And he actually wins in 1796, 97. Washington steps away and Adams bests Jefferson in this contest. And at the time, the person who comes in second for the presidency becomes vice president, um, which because they weren't imagining political parties. So that's a, like a really weird thing. Oh, you're going to have Joe Biden. The person who came in second is Donald Trump as the vice president. A heartbeat away. I would, you know, you know, tr tr uh, Biden could never turn his back on, on, on his vice president, literally, you know, if, if those, that's an assassination instead of waiting to happen. But that's the original thing. Adams against Jefferson because um, Washington is now gone. Now it's a real contest. And they were friends before, but now they're rivals. And Adams makes a huge mistake as president. He criminalizes the opposition. And the opposition is, in fact, led by his own vice president, Mike Pence. Oh, I mean, I'm joking about Mike Pence. I mean, Thomas Jefferson. So this is the are, Alien and Sedition Act? Yes, it's the Sedition Act of 1798 that he signs into law that makes it a crime to criticize him. Um, and, and in the end of the day, 
This is a book all about a constitutional conversation and all about the media and newspapers and the importance of discourse. Um, and people um, were allowed to oppose the Constitution and they weren't shut down. Um, and, um, and people who have voted against the Constitution still voted for George Washington because we actually let freedom of speech prevail. Adams was bad on this. He didn't get it. So he signed his name to a law that made it a crime to criticize Adams. Um, and he brutally, and he, and he, and he, and he, and he very um, vigorously enforces that law and doesn't pardon anyone who's um, convicted under. And, and, and you know who's actually encouraging people to criticize John Adams secretly? The vice president of the United States, Thomas Jefferson. And in fact, Thomas Jefferson, strictly speaking, was guilty of the crime. He was um, um, a co-conspirator, um, uh, an accomplice. Um, we only know that later on. So, so now there's a rematch between Adams and Jefferson in 1800. The sitting president running against the sitting vice president. It would be as if, you know, in 2020, it were Pence against Trump or something. And in that rematch... Adams loses, and I say rightly so in the end, because he didn't understand freedom of speech. And George Washington didn't try to suppress his critics. Um, and, and Adams did. So Jefferson wins. But it's, it's complicated because you, um, um, there were these procedural technicalities. Everyone who votes for Jefferson for president also votes for his running mate, Burr, for vice president. But at the time, there it wasn't a technical way of saying, oh, it's, Ad it's Jefferson for president and Burr for vice president. So they end up tied in the Electoral College. And who's going to undo the tie? Oh, it's the Federalist Party in Congress. And so they're, they're thinking about doing This is the John Adams Party. Yeah. John Adams brought all sorts of mischief, okay? And this is like some of the mischief, you know, that, 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 that Trump and his allies are, are cooking. This it becomes more clear to me, you see, um, after in 2020. But here's the amazing part of the story that, that our audience doesn't know. Here's what they know. At the end of the day, Congress votes to certify Thomas Jefferson as president and Adams leaves office and Jefferson uh, takes over. So that's the standard story. Peaceful transition of power from one party to another. And that's 80% of the story. That's true. But here's the, the two things that I see now um, a complicated thing. One, oh, one of these political parties tried to criminalize the opposition. And, and, and this is a danger today, you know, that trying to. Um, so Trump, even before he was elected, was going around saying, lock her up, lock her up. A, a well-regulated democracy doesn't criminalize political opponents. And, and thank God Trump didn't do that. But, you know, left to his own devices, I think he had these authoritarian tendencies. And Adams gave in to that. And we need to learn from his mistakes. That's why he's the only one-term president at the, at, at the founding, for one reason. A second, which is not so great, is um, actually the Electoral College favors the South because of the three-fifths clause. And, and the South gets extra credit, including Thomas Jefferson, because it's getting Southern votes and, and their, elect, and their um, electoral count is padded because they've got a lot of slaves. So I tell that part of the story, too. That's, but, but here's the, the final part of the story that, that I didn't really focus on so much. I bet our audience doesn't know. Thomas Jefferson is worried that the Federalists are going to try to pull a fast one in one way. And, and some of the things that they can do, they're legally allowed to do, but they would be dirty pool, but they're, but they're legal. And Thomas Jefferson is sending letters to the governor of Virginia, who's his friend um, James, and neighbor, James Monroe, saying, if they try to pull anything, I want you to mobilize the Virginia militia and have them march with their guns on Washington, D.C., we came close to that happening in 1800, 1801, and that should, you know, scare us a little bit. Like this almost happened, and now it didn't. And it need, and we need to study history to make sure that the mistakes aren't repeated, like the Sedition Act, you know, criminalizing the opposition. You know, even thinking about marching on Washington with guns. But Thomas Jefferson actually did think about that, um, and thank God he didn't do it. So. Um, I think, yes, history doesn't repeat itself, but we can learn a lot from what happened in the past. Is this how we start to see our political system turn into a two-party 
system? It's exactly when the two-party system begins to emerge. Our audience, because it's a smart audience, was taught, oh, James Madison writes The Federalist 10, and oh, that is a famous essay against parties, against factions. Yeah, but what they forget, or they may not know, is later on, James Madison, with his friend Thomas Jefferson, will found the first major and the longest um, con- in a running political party. They call themselves back then the, the Democratic Republicans, the Republicans. Um, today, we call that the Democratic Party. It's going to be it's founded by Je- Madison and Jefferson. It's going to become the party of Jackson, and it will later become the party of, of James Buchanan and Woodrow Wilson and Franklin Roosevelt and John Kennedy and Barack Obama. And, and there were a lot of zigzags in that slalom, you know. Uh, but, but even today, the Democratic Party has a dinner called, you know, the Jefferson Jackson Dinner. So, so um, the, it, the Democratic Party sees its founders as Thomas Jefferson and Andrew Jackson. Akhil Rita Marr has been our guest. Again, Akhil Rita Marr is a Sterling Professor of Law and Political Science at Yale University, author of a number of books. He has joined us for a conversation on his very latest. It's called The Words That Made Us, America's Constitutional Conversation, 1760 to 1840. Akhil Rita Amar, I always enjoy our conversations very much, and I thank you dearly. Uh, and I'm not sure you enjoy them as much as I do. Anytime you want me back, I'm here. <laughs>